Um, this morning I woke up. Uh, anybody have your windows down last night? Anybody? Am I the only one? Um, I woke up this morning thinking it's it's a nice fall like. You don't need the air conditioning anymore. You don't necessarily need the heat. And then I woke up freezing this morning. Um, did not want to get out of bed. Uh, anyway, um, but I did, and here we are. And uh, I am really glad for that. I actually love uh, autumn. It is. Um, I don't. I, I once said, you know, I love the fall one time, and someone was like, "Are you?" You can't just say, you can't say that in church, like the fall, because it references the fall from grace <laughs> into sin. So anyway, um, so now I use the term autumn. It feels more elegant, right? Okay. Um, so it is, it, it, it's hard to believe that we are more than halfway through October. Is anybody else kind of like boggled by that? I can't believe we got two more weeks left until November. That is wild. Some of you are like, really? I mean, isn't it, isn't it March? No, we, we missed that month. Um, so this year has been filled with a lot of chaos and uncertainty, and it seems like we are steaming towards this crescendo of crazy that some call the election, right? Um, and and it, it, it seems like in light of all of the division and misinformation and wild opinions that are being lobbed around like Molotov cocktails, uh, it, it's easy to feel sort of powerless right now. Does anybody feel like that? Like you just kind of like, you, you're, everybody's got an opinion, everybody's got something to say, and it's just this white noise of what seems like nonsense. And you're like, I want to say something, I want to do something, but I feel totally powerless to do anything, right? And so what, what's the answer? What does everybody say? Because I think everyone's kind of in that boat in our society, and the answer that's being given to us is vote, right? You feel powerless, you feel like you can't do anything, vote. And all of our hopes and dreams are now set on this, again, crescendo of something that's supposed to take place in November that's supposed to fix everything with a vote. Just vote. That's all that matters. That's where the power is. Cast your vote and everything's going to change. And look, hear me. Your vote does matter. Look, I'm, I'm going to vote. You should all vote, okay? It does matter. But what if the person you vote for doesn't win? Then guess what? Your vote didn't matter. You can't say that. Can't, that's, like, that's like you can't, somebody's like, I can't believe you said that. Your vote doesn't matter. Look, the point I'm trying to make, again, vote. But do not be deceived into thinking that all you have is a vote. This morning, I want to look at an eternally bigger picture through the perspective that Jesus gives to a church who believes they have but little power. This morning we've come to chapter 3, um, and we're going to be in chapter 3, verse 7 through 13 in our series through the book of Revelation. And in this passage, Jesus addresses his church in the city of Philadelphia. Not, the, not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. They didn't exist yet. Um, but the Philadelphian church in what is now Turkey, which was then the Roman province of Asia Minor. And the Philadelphian church was not a big church. It, was a, 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 it wasn't very influential by any standard. Um, it, it wasn't a powerful church, even by the ancient standards of big or influential. To them, it seemed like their vote didn't really matter. In fact, they were suppressed and marginalized even in their city, Within the, and especially within the Roman Empire. But Jesus has a very different perspective to give them because Jesus is looking at a very different kingdom than the Roman kingdom. And he's looking at a very different kingdom when he looks at us as well because he has a different perspective. So this morning, I want to behold the words of King Jesus to the church in Philadelphia, and I want to let his words shift our perspective and lift our heads as we behold the true King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so the world's going to tell you 
that you are valuable because of your influence. Many of you might have a lot of anxiety or, or midlife crises or, or quarter life crises even because you think that your value lies in your influence, that you matter because of how much you impact the world around you. Go to any youth group, maybe not all of them, hopefully not all of them, but most of them, and you're going to hear a heavy emphasis placed on things like changing the world, doing great things, right? Being great, influential people, that this is your call in life, to be important influencers in the world. Sound familiar? Your voice matters. God's called you to be super influencers. World overcomers. Everybody stand and cheer. This is your time. Right? This culture eats that stuff up. Society loves to celebrate and even idolize influence. Your influence. Your kingdom, your Twitter, your Instagram, like, 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 followers. Like, wow, you have how many followers? You must be really important. <laughs> right? Like, if social media sheds any light on anything, it's that our obsession with followers and likes is a pandemic. Influence, 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 reputation, reputation, reputation. But when Jesus addresses the church in Philadelphia, he completely flips the whole thing upside down. Remember last week, we talked about the church in Sardis. And the church in Sardis had this great reputation. They had a reputation for being alive. They were big influencers. They were a church with great influence. But Jesus tells them that although he knows they have a reputation for being alive, they were dead. You know, it's amazing what we're willing to compromise in the name of influence. The start of seems it was willing to compromise the very integrity of the message of Jesus. And so now Jesus is addressing the church in Philadelphia. Right after he addresses the church in Sardis comes this church in Philadelphia. Make no mistake these two churches are purposefully juxtaposed against one another in Scripture. Because while Sardis was only alive in reputation, Philadelphia had a reputation and their reality or their experience was that they were suppressed. They were marginalized. They were slandered and they were persecuted. This was a church who had the common experience of having lost everything for the sake of Christ. And yet, even in the midst of it, they never wavered in their faithful confession that Jesus is their Lord no matter what. They never compromised because their hope was not in this world. Their hope was in Christ and Christ alone. Whenever we sing that song, by the way, I, I just, I'm like, you get ready. I'm going to preach it. Because I love that song, In Christ Alone, it's great. Back to my notes. I just love it. They, they may have been, they, this was their hope. It's just in Christ, it's not in this world, it's not in our circumstances. It's a joy that's deeper, it transcends, it's a reality, it's a perspective of beholding King Jesus. And he declares these ordinary, everyday Christians to be the very conduits of the power that would literally change the world. That they would be the world changers, but not in the way that the world thinks it's going to come. Because it's not something that they would do one day, right? It's not something you're going to one day change the world. That's not what he says. He doesn't preach to them. He doesn't address them. And he doesn't say, one day you're going to do this. It's going to be awesome, right? You're going to be amazing. What he says is that he was already doing something in them. That it was through his everyday faithfulness to his everyday faithful people that was already changing the world around them. 
It wasn't a big explosive event. The big explosive event was Christ's resurrection. What, they, what, what he says is, again, that it was through his everyday faithfulness to his everyday faithful people. And what we'll see is that Jesus declares these ordinary faithful Christians to be the very pillars of the house of God and the coming kingdom of God upon the earth. Like they were a conduit or a doorway of God's presence. And so this morning, I want to look at Christ's address to the church in Philadelphia, and I want to show you the difference between being an influencer and a disciple maker. I want to take a look at how the kingdom of heaven is actually established upon the earth through the everyday faithfulness of ordinary Christians, even in extraordinary circumstances. So you can influence people from a distance. You can impact their lives and you can be very impressive. But disciples are made in person. Always. Jesus didn't just call us to be impressive social media influencers. <laughs> He called us to be disciple makers. And so that only happens in real community. When your heart is on display, when you invite others to behold the king of glory alongside you, you're not, you're not setting yourself above them like, okay, little Padawan, you need to follow me and be like me. No, you come around. Making disciples is a team effort. It's the community of believers. It's the church that comes along one another in community groups on Sunday and you walk through life and you say vulnerably, I don't have it all together. I need Jesus. And so do you, let's seek him together. Let's allow his spirit to change our perspective together and love one another as he has loved us. We are to love one another. And this is how Jesus says, the world will know you are my disciples. That is what changes the world. And that only happens in real community. It doesn't just happen from a platform. Like praise God for a platform. But the church isn't just a platform, contrary to popular belief, <laughs> right? We say it all the time. Church is not a place you go or an event that you attend. It's a people you belong with. This is the church. The church is a community. It's a community of authenticity and truth where Jesus is lifted high, not just a selfie. So here's what I want you to get this morning. If you get nothing else, this is what I want you to get. Jesus expands his kingdom upon the earth through the everyday faithfulness of everyday Christians. Jesus expands his kingdom upon the earth through the everyday faithfulness of everyday Christians. Don't, don't get me wrong. I am very thankful, extremely thankful actually, for amazing and anointed leaders throughout the centuries in the church. They are extremely impactful. They have been extremely influential in my life as well, right? And, and, and it's fantastic. There's countless men and women who should be honored and celebrated. I, I, I'm, look, I'm even thankful for the influence of social media, right? I probably need to post more. <laughs> I'm not trying to demonize that stuff, but it's easy to fall victim to the world's way of doing things and miss the perspective of heaven, and the ways that Jesus has called us to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples that changes the world. Though you think you have but little power, he has a different perspective. So turn with me to Revelation 3, verse 7 through 13. That's where we're going to be this morning. I don't know if I'm going to get through all of the verses this morning. We might have to come back to it next week. We'll see. Um, the title of our series through Revelation is again called Victory Unveiled. And the title of this sermon this morning is Victory Unveiled in the Everyday Faithfulness of the Church. So a quick context for Revelation, uh, just to catch you all up here, uh, about 50 to 60 years after Jesus was crucified and resurrected, the Apostle John is the last of the original 12 disciples that were still alive on the earth at this time. He's probably about 90 or so years old, and he's been exiled to the island of Patmos because, well, he was a threat to the entire empire because he was, well, he walked with Jesus and he held uh, unmatched and unquestioned authority in the eyes of the church. So he, uh, church history actually tells us that the Romans tried to cook him alive in a bronze bull, 
but he miraculously survived. And they exiled him to this island that was off the coast of the Roman province of Asia Minor, which is uh, modern-day Turkey. Um, and so we also know that uh, there was a great trial or a persecution that was about to hit all of the churches in that area. Um, it, it had either just begun or it was about to hit them under the emperor Trajan. And so there had been outbreaks of persecution against the church before this in the first century AD, but nothing like what was getting ready to happen to them under Trajan. And so there, uh, this letter is written to prepare the church for what was about to happen to them. It was written to fix their eyes on the risen Lord because of what was getting ready to happen to them in the first century AD. So this letter isn't just for people 2,000 years later. It was also specific and right on time for that church in that time period. We're also going to see that this letter is also written to us today. It's a revelation for all churches to behold Jesus as he truly is and to view their circumstances in light of his glory, knowing that we live in a time period where tribulation and persecution and suffering does happen a lot. We're going to talk a lot more about that as we go through Revelation, but I want you to see that John receives, uh, uh, that, that this is a letter to the churches to behold Jesus as he truly is and to view their circumstances in light of his glory. And so John receives this revelation of the risen Christ, and then he sends it to all the churches of the Roman province of Asia or, or Asia Minor. And so again, there are seven major mail routes stops in the province of Asia at this point, okay? Um, and each city has a church that's planted in it, seven churches. So when, when you say the seven churches of Asia Minor, that's what we're talking about. These seven churches that are in these cities on this mail route through this province, okay? And so um, it, it's important to understand the, the way we understand this letter and really understand this mysterious letter is to understand who this letter was originally written to, which is these seven churches, and understanding what they were going through. And so you need to remember that it's written to every church throughout history, but originally to them. In other words, what we're about to receive was first received by the church in Philadelphia, but its truths also transcend prophetically to us here today at Risen. Got me? Okay. That was my context. Here we go. So this is the sixth stop on this mail route. And so we've come to Revelation 3, verse 7, um, and the church in Philadelphia, which says this. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Woo! It's always a good day in church when we talk about the synagogue of Satan, right? So, what's going on here? First of all, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, this sounds a lot like what Jesus said to another church in Smyrna. He uses the same language. In fact, Philadelphia, like, uh, or, or, or in fact, Smyrna and Philadelphia are the only two churches that receive only commendation and encouragement from Jesus. Everyone else either gets a mixture of both rebuke, warning, and encouragement, or just straight up rebuke and warning like we heard in Sardis last week. And so their context Philadelphia and Smyrna, their context is actually really similar. They've experienced persecution. They've experienced extreme tribulation. And, and even that persecution is similar. Jesus even uses the same language to describe their persecutors. 
It's, it's not trivial language either. He refers to the local synagogue of Jews as a synagogue of Satan. So, remember that this is a Roman city. And in Rome, they had what was called the imperial cult, where they worshipped the, the Roman emperor as God, right? This was part of the, uh, this was a, um, a cult that was implemented by one of the Caesars um, around the turn of the first century. And, and they forced everyone to sacrifice or light incense or worship the emperor or the Caesar as God. Now, they didn't mind if you worshiped other gods. You just had to acknowledge that the Roman emperor was also a god, okay? So they would erect statues of the emperor, and you would be forced to light incense again or, or make some form of sacrifice declaring that the emperor was also your god. And if you didn't do this, then it would be seen as treason, and it would have been punishable by death. So we talked about this again when we talked about Smyrna, but it's so important because it's the same context that's here in Philadelphia. And so pay attention because this really affects what's going on in the entire New Testament era, actually, during this time. So the only group who had a special exemption from this kind of worship were the Jews. They didn't have to do it. They had actually worked really hard for that status of privileged exemption. And they were already resented by the other Romans for it. So they were already side-eyed and potentially seen as treasonous. Okay? People knew that the Jewish people had this philosophy or this prophetic expectation of a Messiah to come and overthrow the Romans. Okay? That's who the Jews were. And they somehow were able to say, hey... Uh, can we just be exempt from that? And because of their numbers and because of a number of things that were probably compromising, they were allowed to not be forced to do it. Then comes these people carrying the message of Jesus Christ. And these guys and gals were saying that all could be grafted into this covenant family of Abraham or the Jews. They were saying this isn't just about the bloodline. This is about what Christ did for us and that his death and resurrection was a way of grafting everyone in to God's covenant family, adopted in for eternity. And so what we get is a group of people that are made up of Jews and Gentiles, and they were not bowing down to the emperor in worship. And so the local Jewish synagogue told everyone, especially the Romans, that these Christians were not Jews. They were not truly Jews. That they were very uh, vocal in saying that the door of the synagogue had been shut to these Christians. That's important. Not only that, but this synagogue who had denied their Messiah... Remember, this is the Jewish synagogue. Jesus was Jewish. He was the king of the Jews. They denied him, and yet they were claiming to be God's true people. Okay? And so they were turning people in. They were turning in the names of these imposters that they referred to as Christians. And so the Jewish synagogue rejected their true king, Jesus Christ, and they shut the door on anyone who received him as their king and savior. And so Jesus here identifies them as the main source of the persecution of the church in Philadelphia, saying they are a synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews, but they lie. So to be a Jew means that your heart belongs to Yahweh or the Lord and that you long for the Messiah to come. That is the heartbeat of the entire Old Testament and everything that the Jewish faith is truly built upon. But these Jews had rejected their Messiah and their hearts were far from God. And all they had was a hollow religion. That sounds politically incorrect because it is politically incorrect, but this is the truth. This is what the Bible says. Now, as I said a few weeks ago, this should never spark any type of anti-Semitic sentiment. No anti-Semitism. There's no room for that in this church. There's no room for any type of racial slur or any type of condemnation in that way at all of anyone or any group. 
In fact, what we see is that the Apostle Paul, who was Jewish, and Jesus, who was Jewish, and even John, the guy who's writing this, who was Jewish, they wept over the Jews. They loved them. But it's also clear here that in the eyes of Jesus, it's no longer about a bloodline. The only blood that matters is the blood of Christ. So the true Jews are represented by the church. And so this synagogue in Philadelphia are only Jewish by ethnicity, and Jesus actually labels them with the godless nations of Isaiah 49, verse 23. Because, and, and, and actually multiple scriptures, but Isaiah 49 references this, saying these godless nations will one day, with their faces to the ground, they shall bow down to you and lick the dust of your feet. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who wait for me shall not be put to shame. Or Isaiah 60, verse 14, which says, the sons of those who afflicted you shall come bending low to you, and all who despised you shall bow down at your feet. They shall call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One one of Israel. And so this is why Jesus introduces himself the way that he does to Philadelphia. It all matters and it matters a lot. Remember, this is always intentional and specific to the context of each church, the way that he introduces himself, right? The way what he says you should behold, it all has to do with the context of what they're dealing with. So look at the characteristics. Look at the characteristics of Jesus that that he says you should behold. Right? The first one is he, he introduces himself as the words of the Holy One. That Jesus is the Holy One. Right? This is the first thing he wants them to behold. Isaiah 40, verse 25, it's a reference. It says, To whom then will you compare me that I should be like him? Says the Holy One. Right? In other words, there's no counterfeit here. These are the words of the one who has no comparison. He has no equal and he has no rival. This is how Jesus introduces himself to Philadelphia. Now watch this because it matters. Isaiah 43, 15 says, I am the Lord, your holy one, the creator of Israel, your king. So when he says, I'm the holy one, he's saying, I'm the one who said that. I'm the one who is your king. You are the true Israel. Even the name Israel was a new name that was given to Jacob after he received God in a personal, relational, and experiential way. If you guys were here when we went through the um, series Stressing for a Blessing on the Life of Jacob, right? We know that Jacob was a man who referred to God as the God of my fathers. Remember this? Throughout his life, he refers to God as the God of my father Abraham, the God of my father Isaac. But he didn't He never referred to God as his Lord and his God until after he had this very personal experience with him and he wrestles with him all night long. And then he, the next morning, he declares that he is my God and my Lord. There's this personal thing that happens and then his name is changed from Jacob to Israel. And so what we see here is that this new name given of Israel implies this personal relational covenant of the heart. It's not just about your fathers. It's not just about what family you were born into. It's about knowing him as your personal Lord and Savior that's implied even in the name Israel. And so Jesus is telling his church, behold, I am the Holy One. There's none like me. You are the true Israel, and I am your king. And so he also says, now watch this, because remember, this is important. I'm going to get heady here, so follow me. He also says that he's the true one, that Jesus is the true one. I want you to miss this because I'm going to get, again, I'm going to get a little deep and philosophical here on you, but I, I think you can handle it. You guys with me? Okay, track with me. So the word for true here has a connotation of something that is ultimately real. Okay, last week we talked a bit about this and we were talking about Jesus being the ultimate reality. That the way we know we are awake and not dreaming is by focusing on what we know to be real, something substantial. 
And so this is a reference to the fact that Jesus is the ultimate substance of reality. That he is the measuring rod by which all else derives its existence. You see, most people try to turn this around. See, everything in all of creation owes its very existence to the higher and ultimate reality of God. So the only way to prove that anything exists is by substantiating it against something of a higher or greater substance. In other words, everything in creation finds its true meaning and identity only in relation to the one who gives it meaning and identity. But in our depravity, we flip this upside down and we demand that God prove himself to us. Which is kind of a blasphemous thought. Not kind of, very blasphemous. People want to know why you can't scientifically prove God's existence. Because our method of measurement excludes the only one who can truly prove anything. In other words, God's reality is beyond existence because all that exists finds its substance to be measurable only in relation to him. You can't prove God's reality by using something less substantial than God. Because God is the ultimate source and substance of everything. He is reality. So telling God to prove himself to you is declaring that you yourself are the ultimate reality and that you yourself are God. That should be a petrifying thought. Now, some of you are like, huh? You're like, what are you talking about? And that's actually kind of the point because the point of this is he's bigger. He's substantial. He's the only one who is trustworthy. He's the only one who is dependable. He is the only one who is faithful. He's the only one who is steadfast and unmoving. He's the only one deserving of our confidence in a season or a life or a circumstance or a world that's constantly shifting and changing and nothing is reliable and nothing that you put your hope in will remain. He says, I am the truth. To sum it up, Jesus is the truth. Say, Jesus is the truth. truth. You can trust him even when you can't trust yourself. You can trust him. And probably the greatest comfort and joy that I have in my whole life is the knowledge that even if I lose my grip on reality in this world, I'll never lose my grip on the reality of Jesus. Because he's holding on to me. I'm not just holding on to him. I meant to share this story. Whew, I can't, I'm not, I, I, I got to get through it. We can do it. I'm, <laughs> I meant to share this story last week when talking about waking up and focusing on the reality of the risen Lord. Um, but God made me circle back to it this week. And, and uh, some of you may have heard me talk about my snowboarding accident that I had when I was in college. Um, it was a pretty stressful season for me. My, my best friend at the time, which was probably the first Christian real Christian brother that I had ever known and had, um, was, was dying of leukemia suddenly. And, uh, it, it, it was, you know, he wasn't given much time to live. And I was a freshman in college and a brand new believer. Um, and, and in my world, it had already been flipped upside down by Jesus, but now I'm going like, what is this? What is happening here? Like I'm confronted with the death of the first person I'd ever met that was alive. Right. And I'm going, well, how does this work? And I didn't know what to do, and and so the only thing I knew at that time how to handle stress was to go blow it all off on a mountainside. (laughs) So um, I went snowboarding and, you know, was just, just tried some really foolish, risky trick, I think, just something stupid um, that I should never have attempted. And I ended up with a massive concussion and legit amnesia. Um, And I actually do remember uh, parts of it. Um, What I remember were kind of, it was kind of like a dream. Um, And I I do remember instinctively uh, popping up and acting like I was fine. You know, I completely wiped out. I didn't have a helmet on or anything. And I I pop up and I'm instinctively snowboarding down the side of that mountain. And I'm petrified, completely petrified, because I didn't know where I was and I didn't know who I was. And, And I had lost my grip on reality. And like, I, I hope you never experience fear like that. Because I I had never experienced anything like it before that. And I I hope um, no one ever does. 
in this room, but my, but my greatest joy in that moment is that even in that place, I didn't know who I was, but I knew who Jesus was. I remember it. Like I had totally lost my mind, but I had not lost my Jesus. He was with me. He met me there. I knew him then, and, and, and he met me in that very real and intimate way that he was with me, that it would be okay, that I could trust him. When they found me, I was wandering around the bottom of the mountain like a blithering idiot. But I was okay. I had this like joy and this hope that didn't honestly make any sense because I knew that my king was sovereign and he was good and he would take care of me. I learned that he is the truth, that he is the way and that he is the life. I learned that nothing can shut the door on his faithful presence. Romans 8, 35 through 38 says this. This is how the apostle Paul put it. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it's written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Say conquerors. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, including snowboarding accidents and you losing your mind, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Tell that to your anxiety. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. Man, this is victory unveiled in his everyday faithfulness to his everyday faithful. And that is how the kingdom is unleashed in our world. So when you operate upon that reality because this is who Jesus is look at the next characteristic and I gotta hurry this thing up because I'm only I'm not even through the characteristics part the next characteristic Jesus is the one who opens and shuts the door look back at verse 7 behold the true one who has the key of David He's the holy one. He's the true one. He has the key of David who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open or no one opens. This is the, the key of David was a high honor that was given to one who had decided um, or, or who got to decide who is given access to the presence of the king and who's not. That's important. The key of David was a high honor that was given to the one who had access to, or, or, or the one who got to decide who had access to the presence of the king. And so Jesus says, I'm the one who has the key of David. I'm the one who decides who has access to the presence of the king. He's saying, I have the key to God's presence, not that synagogue who shut the door on you. Not that situation or circumstance or persecution or, or that slander or that you received or that lie that you heard in your mind from maybe a parent or someone that you love that you hold their value high. Not them. Jesus holds the key to the presence of God. And this is what he says to the church in Philadelphia. I know your works. In other words, I see you and I see the symptom and evidence of your heart. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Whew. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. I, I, I love this. 
Jude 24 puts it like this. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Verse 8 continues. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word. You guarded it in your heart and have not denied my name. And so this is not just for the super apostles. Hear me. This is for his everyday people, his everyday faithful. This is for all of us. And this is how the kingdom advances upon the earth. You know those seven churches? You know who planted those seven churches? It wasn't the apostles. They helped, but it was the everyday faithful people. This is the doorway through which his presence floods our church and our homes and our city and our world. It's not just through the big impressive platforms. It's when his everyday faithfulness is demonstrated by his everyday faithful. It's not the celebrity who happened to mention Jesus that one time. Okay? It's, it's not the MVP who gives thanks to God, but is clearly worshiping the trophy that he's holding. Okay? I'm not th- trying to throw all those guys on the bus. Some of them are awesome. Right? But... That's not how the kingdom is built. It's not. It advances through those who are faithful, his everyday faithful, not just his one day faithful, his everyday faithful, those who show up consistently and faithfully. Those, not because it happened to work out that week, not, not because they didn't have anything else to do, not even because they particularly wanted to, but because community matters. Because faithfulness matters. Because his people and his word matter. Not because you think you're even going to get anything out of it. Because you matter to God's faithful people. Because you're called to be his hands and feet. The expression on his face, the sound of his voice. I've said it before. You want to know what the hug of Jesus feels like? Hug somebody with the spirit of God inside of them. Because we are the body of Christ. This is the church. And it advances through those who show up and it advances through those who speak up faithfully, boldly, and lovingly. Not because they want to be right, but because they need, not not because they need to defend Jesus. He's pretty strong. He's going to be all right. (laughs) But because this is good news. Because you can't help it because there's like a fire in your bones. Because this is our commission. Because this gospel has been so twisted and perverted in this world that they need to hear the truth. Because Jesus is worthy of our obedience to love the people he died to save. And it advances through those who lay their lives down in service and in generosity to others for the kingdom of heaven, in your church, in your families, not because they always deserve it, but because Jesus does. And his love for them courses through your veins. Whether you feel it or not, you do it because you know he delights in it. And it's worship. And because, well, behold, Jesus Christ. This is how his kingdom advances. This is how our children will know him. This is how your spouse will feel him. This is how your workplace will see him. This is how our city will hear him. This is how the world will behold him. And this is how his victory will be unveiled to a broken world in need of him. Through his everyday faithfulness to his everyday faithful, faithful people. This is the very epitome of Revelation 12, 11, which I've said before, if there is a memory verse in the book of Revelation, is this one. If you were to memorize any one of them, is Revelation 12, 11. In fact, let's read it together. You ready? Here we go. Revelation 12, verse 11. It says this, and it's talking about Satan. How do you conquer? This is how we conquer. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Woo! It ain't a selfie. It's the opposite of a selfie. It's his influence in and through us, which is making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And that happens in community and that happens in person. Verse 11, 
I'm going to speed this thing up here. We might have to come back to this, but I'm going to read through it here. Verse 11, it says, I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down from my God out of heaven and my, and my own new name. In other words, you're going to get a new name. Like Jacob got a new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, real quickly, I just want to hone in on this pillar thing. Because to a world that had just been ravaged, we talk about this, that this world had just been ravaged, um, particularly this area, uh, Sardis especially, but also Philadelphia had just been ravaged by an earthquake. Just a generation before them shook the very foundations of their homes and their cities, and basically nothing remained. And so this is the image that are given to these people, is a pillar, an unmovable, unshakable pillar. <laughs> this is... This is what's given. This is the, 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 a pillar that doesn't tumble. When the earth quakes and all the foundations are shaken, much like they have been in our society recently. When anxiety is roaring all around you and mental health issues seem to be everywhere. The band-aids aren't going to do it, guys. It's not anything to be ashamed of. But the answer is in Christ. I'm not saying anything against medication or anything like that. Praise God. But I'm telling you, the source of our reality is Jesus Christ. Behold him. When the earth quakes and the foundations are sh shaken, be rooted in Christ. Those who are rooted in him as the cornerstone, the sure, firm foundation, the rock of our salvation, they will be steadfast and true. They will be faithful, reliable, faithful, unmoved. When things are shaken, we can rest upon him. It's not about your feelings. It's about what's true and what's not. And when anxiety roars, we come together. We behold Jesus Christ. When anxiety comes against you, you realize that all that is is a lie. And it often is an appealing to your pride. In other words, again, this is not politically correct, but whatever. Anxiety is often, if not always, you assuming you know better than God. It is a pride thing. Is it, an, it is an assumption that he will not be in your future. It is an imagining of a future that does not involve him because if he's good and he'll take care of you and he loves you and he promises to guard and keep you then what are you anxious about it's not sinful to be assaulted by anxiety okay but it is sinful to indulge it it is sinful to give it voice. It is sinful to allow it to ravage your life. When anxiety roars at you, we died, preached a sermon about this when the whole pandemic thing kicked off, right? When anxiety roars, look to Jesus who roars louder. He'll never abandon you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And this is the last thing here that I want to point out about a pillar, especially in the ancient world. Oftentimes we think of a pillar and we only think of it as its functional utility. Like we've got these pillars in here, they're holding up the roof, right? Or we think, okay, well, the church needs you. The church needs your, uh, your function in order to happen. Some of that's true. He has designed this thing to run on with people. It matters, right? But one of the aspects of a pillar, especially in the ancient world, is that they were beautiful. They were gorgeous. They were adorned. They had names written on them. They were, they were places of when you would walk into temples and you'd see those pillars, they had gold on them. They would have been like, this is, this is it, amazing. Because Jesus sees you not just as a functional utility, but as a beautiful 
precious child. You're beautiful to him. He loves you. He delights in you. He cares for you. This is how he sees his people. He's placed an open door before you. And it's through that open door that he brings the kingdom to bear upon the earth. It comes spiritually now. One day it will come physically. And the foundations that we implement now, the spiritual foundations of the kingdom of heaven that we implement now in our families, in our church, in our city, those things will remain and they will manifest physically when Jesus returns. Your endurance, your patient endurance with your children, in your workplace, in your church, in your life, in your neighborhood, it will not be shaken. Though the whole earth pass away, those things will remain and they will flourish when he returns. This is the power. This is the power of Christ in you. Remember that ultimately what matters isn't who is in the Oval Office but who is on the throne of heaven. We've been called to that same mission with that same passion and that same mission message of that same Jesus, no matter what the circumstances are. This is what changes the world. These are the foundations he's establishing for his kingdom and our church and our home and our city and our world. May you be faithful and be beautiful pillars of God and the kingdom upon the earth now as it is in heaven. This is how it advances, victory unveiled through God's everyday faithful.